So we can go on to step four and write the kinematics variables. And right off the bat, we can write the vertical acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, there's that uncomfortable feeling again. This seems really weird. We wouldn't want to write an acceleration without a sign. We better write the sign in for that acceleration. Well, we know that our accelerations are down from gravity, but we've chosen up as our positive direction. Since we've chosen up as the positive direction, this acceleration has to be negative. If you've chosen up as your positive direction and you're accelerating down, this acceleration has to be negative. So you can see that there's a lot of sign issues on this problem. Well, hopefully at this point you've gotten into the habit of being hyper-conscious about the signs on every problem. So I hope that at least you were thinking about all the different signs. Uh, it's possible that you might have gotten some of the signs wrong, but I hope you didn't get any of the signs wrong just because you didn't think about them. At this point, if you've been following along with the systematic approach, you should always be thinking about the signs on every problem. You still might get them wrong, but at least you won't get them wrong because you totally ignored the signs. Uh, at least we're thinking about the signs uh, for every single concept. Okay, uh, what else do we know here? A uh, person stands on the edge of a cliff that's 15 meters above the ground. We've already seen how that gave us our displacement, which was negative 15 meters. Again, that's something that a lot of people would get wrong here. They wouldn't realize um, that the displacement is uh, negative 15. Uh, but again, the point is the initial position is on the cliff, and then the final position is here on the ground. So going from the initial to final, we're moving downwards. Well, that's our negative direction, since we chose upwards as our positive direction. Uh, one thing I can mention now here is, I think a lot of people would try to do this problem in two steps. A lot of people would think this is a two-step problem. They might think that first they have to analyze um, the motion when we go up to the peak, and then they have to analyze the motion from the peak down to the ground. So they might split this up into two separate problems, going up to the peak and then going down from the peak to the ground. Well, you could solve the problem that way, but it's not necessary. We don't have to split this up into two separate problems. We're going to solve the problem just in one fell swoop. We're going to solve it in just one step um, by just comparing this initial position and this final position, um, which means that we're actually not really going to have to say anything about the peak, because notice the peak was neither the initial nor the final position. The peak was just in the middle. Well, we don't care about the points that are in the middle, we just care about the initial and the final position. So we're actually going to be able to pretty much ignore what was happening at the peak here. We can ignore what's happening at the peak. All we really care about is what's happening at the initial and the final positions on the cliff and on the ground. So those are the two points that we're going to be uh, focused on here. Um, so notice that the displacement here doesn't take into account this movement up here uh, because uh, hopefully you've been encountered the difference between distance and displacement. Uh, as you already should have learned in your course, the distance is the total distance that you've covered, like an odometer would read. Well, the total distance that we've covered would have to include this upward portion and this entire downward portion. If we were trying to figure out the distance that the object was traveling, we'd have to figure out the distance it covers going up and then the distance it covers going down. But um, the displacement is a different type of concept. The displacement doesn't keep track of all the ground that you've covered. It just compares the initial and final positions. The displacement is found just by comparing the initial and the final positions. It doesn't matter um, what uh, the path was in between the initial and final positions. So I'll say that again. The displacement simply compares the initial and the final positions. Um, the displacement is not affected by what your path was in between the initial and final positions. One more time. The displacement is not affected by what your path was between the initial and the final positions. The displacement only depends um, on comparing the initial and final positions. You can see that if you write out the formula for displacement. This is delta y. Well, I hope that you know that delta means y final minus y initial. The way we find a change is just to compare the final and the initial positions. So again, this shows the displacement depends on just comparing the final and the initial positions. Um, what the path looked like in between the initial and final positions is irrelevant for the displacement. The path is very important if you're trying to figure out distance. But as you've seen, distance is actually not a very useful concept in kinematics. When we're working with kinematics, we don't work with distance. We work with displacement. So we don't care about the path. We just care about the initial and the final points. 
This formula again shows that the displacement just compares the initial and the final points. It doesn't concern itself with what happened between the initial and the final points. All right, so again, um, since this is our initial point and this is our final point, the displacement uh, between the initial and the final point is 15 meters down. Um, and we don't need to figure out what the exact distance is that the object covered moving up to the peak and then moving down to the peak. We just compare how far was it from the initial to the final point. It was 15 meters in a downward direction. All right, now our initial vol vertical velocity we've already seen is positive 3 meters per second because we chose up to be positive. Find the velocity with which the object strikes the ground. Well, we've labeled striking the ground as our final point. So the question is asking us for that final velocity. Let me mention an issue that I brought up on an earlier problem. Um, some people might be confused because they might say, well, obviously, after the object hits the ground, its velocity is zero. They might say, well, obviously, after we hit the ground, the velocity is zero. Um, but remember, we're not supposed to be trying to find the velocity the instant after we hit the ground. We're trying to find the velocity the instant before we hit the ground. Obviously, the instant after you hit the ground, you're not going to be moving anymore. Um, but the instant before you hit the ground, you are moving quite quickly. Well, that's what we're really trying to figure out. Uh, one way to see that is, again, remember, we're supposed to use this approach for projectile motion when the only force on the object is gravity. This whole approach only works for when the only force on the object is gravity. Well, um, the instant before the object hits the ground, it's still not touching the ground yet, so the only force on it is gravity. So we can still use kinematics to find that. But the instant after the object hits the ground, it's feeling a force from the ground. So the whole kinematics approach wouldn't apply then anymore. We couldn't use our normal projectile motion. All right, so the instant after the object has hit the ground, it's feeling a force not just from gravity, but also from the ground. So we wouldn't be able to use the same acceleration anymore because this is just the acceleration from gravity. Instead, it should be clear that we're focusing on how fast the object was moving the instant before it hit the ground. At that point, it was still only feeling the force of gravity. Um, and that's not obvious. That's what we have to try to figure out. All right, so we have to figure this out. And notice again that we're actually really going to just ignore what happened at the peak. You don't need to know what happened during the path to compare the initial and the final points here. We don't need to know what happened at the peak uh, to figure out what the final velocity is going to be here. Um, so that was our step four. Uh, remember that we're ready to go on to step five when we've written down three numbers. Well, we've got three numbers now. So now we should be able to pick a kinematics equation. We want the equation that's missing the time. The one thing that we haven't uh, got a number for is time, and that's not part of the question either. So let's pick the kinematics equation that's missing the time. Here's the kinematics equation that's missing the time. Let's plug in. V final is what we don't know, so we don't plug in for that. We need to plug in for V initial, starting with parentheses to set off the sign. Even when we're plugging in a positive number, we still always indicate the sign. That should be automatic at this point. Parentheses to help us plug in the acceleration, which is negative 9.8. Negative 9.8. And parentheses to plug in the displacement, which is negative 15. Let me remind you of something I think I mentioned on an earlier example, which is that you don't want to plug in prematurely. Start by writing the general equation. So you should actually physically write down this equation. Remember that I'm trying to put on the board the exact work that I would recommend doing for this problem. So I actually recommend actually writing down this equation. Don't just look at it in your cheat sheet and plug in, but actually write it down. Only after you've written down the general equation is it a good idea to start plugging in. Uh, that's a good way to make sure you're getting the signs correct. Um, I think some people might have gotten confused here and thought that they were supposed to subtract. They might have said, well, gee, the acceleration is going to be negative, so I should subtract. But you can see that would be a mistake because we're going to take care of that negative when we plug in the acceleration. When we plugged in the acceleration, we plugged in a negative number for the acceleration. It would be kind of double counting if we also had a negative subtraction over here as well. 
So just plug in the general equation, including the plus sign. And then when you plug in the number for the acceleration, you're going to indicate what the sign is going to be for that. And by the same token, when we plug in the displacement, we indicated the sign for that. Uh, but in the general equation, we still start with the normal plus sign, which is the way this equation um, looks in our notes. And here we still have the plus sign. We, got, um, we simply had to plug in negative signs for these two variables when we plug them in. All right, so now we continue to simplify. 3 squared is 9. Uh, you can see that this term is going to end up being positive because a negative times a negative is a positive. So we know the second term is going to be positive because we have a negative times a negative, which is a positive. Well, the easy multiplication here is 2 times 15. 2 times 15 is 30. And we've still got to deal with this 9.8. 2 times 15 is 30, and we still have to multiply by 